Hi everyone, welcome to our next installment of the Zoo to You. My name is Lane and this here is Morgan. We are two animal ambassador keepers here at the Central Florida Zoo and Botanical Gardens. And today we have with us a few of our animal ambassadors that we want to teach you guys a little bit about, share some natural history, as well as kind of tell you guys a little bit about some of the challenges that their species face in their natural habitat. So we're going to go ahead and start off with Morgan. She's going to go ahead and tell you guys a little bit about Brosian, our red-fronted macaw. Hello, Lane's up. This is Brosian, and Brosian is our red-fronted macaw. And Brosian was actually born right here at the Central Florida Zoo, and he is actually 20 years old. So a lot of you guys might be thinking, 20 years old, that's pretty old. But actually, Brosian could probably live to be in his 50s or even his 60s, especially here at the zoo. So Brosian's pretty young. You guys might notice the first thing you guys might notice when you look at Brosian, he's dancing a little bit for you, is the red feathers on the front of his head. And that is how he got, gets his name, a red-fronted macaw, is because of those feathers. So a lot of times when you guys think of birds, you guys think of them flying, which is the main, main way that Brosian gets around. But he does do some other things as well to help him move around in his natural environment that he lives in. We'll see if he'll take this nut that I have for him. So when Brosian grabs this almond that he's chewing on, he's using his beak and hopefully he'll use his feet as well. Like that, just like that. And we'll talk a little bit about his feet. So his feet are actually special feet. They're called zygodactyl feet. So they have two toes facing forward and two toes facing backwards. Those toes are very special because they help him grab onto nuts like he did, did right there. They also help him for climbing. So sometimes flying takes a lot of energy. So he'll climb up a tree to get from one place to another and he'll use those special feet and that beak to help him climb up that tree. So his beak is very strong. You guys saw that he cracked through that almond with no problems at all. So it's a very strong beak. He can also hang, hang from that beak. He does that here sometimes at the zoo in his enclosure. He'll hang from his beak and dance around kind of like he's dancing right now. Brosian does eat a lot of different things. You saw that he was eating an almond. Seeds, seeds are his number one thing that he likes to eat, but he also eats fruits, veggies, and some leaves as well. And Brosian is found in the scrublands of Bolivia. So there he actually eats several different types of cactus as well, which is a little different than most birds. Brosian is a very social bird. So these birds actually are monogamous. So that means that he will mate for life. So he, if he finds a female bird, they'll mate for life and they'll be the same couple forever. Even though they are paired birds, they do like to live in big groups as well. So he can live in groups of up to 30 different parrots at a time, which is quite a lot of parrots. And they will also self-groom each other. So Brosian, if he had a mate, him and his mate would groom each other. They maybe even like lock feet to show that they like each other. They do special things like that. They also make noises. You guys might be hearing Brosian make some little tiny noises while he's here. Um, sometimes he makes little small noises. Uh, they usually do that with their pair mate to show that they're affectionate towards, towards each other. He also maybe will do an alert call as well. Um, but right now he's very interested in eating that almond that he has. So Brosian, like I said before, is found in Bolivia and he's found in the scrublands of Bolivia. And that is actually the only place in the world that you will find red-fronted macaws. And these red-fronted macaws are actually endangered because a lot of the places where he lives are being destructed. Habitat destruction is taking away a lot of these natural places where Brosian is found. Due to that, he actually, birds like Brosian in the wild will start to go and graze on farmers' crops. And then these farmers tend to trap these birds or hunt these birds because they don't like them eating their crops. So these are some of the reasons why red-fronted macaws are endangered in their natural habitat. So deforestation and dis uh, disruption of habitat could be some of the reasons why these guys are endangered. And those reasons also affect some of our species right here at home. And Lane's gonna talk about some of these species. Absolutely. So we're gonna grab our gopher tortoise here, get him for you guys. So we have two Florida native species right here. We've got a gopher tortoise, his name is Franklin. And then we have indigo, who I'm holding, the Eastern indigo snake. Um, now both of these, like I said, um, both of these animals are found right here in Florida and they actually rely on each other. More so the Eastern indigo snake relies on the gopher tortoise. Now gopher tortoises, they get their name because they actually dig quite a bit. Gopher tortoises have some really strong claws, toenails at the end that you can see. He's gonna use those to really dig down deep and they can dig super deep, super long burrows. And they're actually what's known as a keystone species because a lot of different species of animals rely on those burrows for survival. Up to over 300 different species will actually use an abandoned burrow created by a gopher tortoise for survival. 
one way that you can tell the difference between turtles and tortoises, because a lot of people look at these guys and they say, look, that's a really cool looking turtle. However, there is a difference between turtles and tortoises. One of those differences, as I kind of briefly mentioned, are the feet. So turtles, they typically have more webbed feet, and that's going to help them in their environments that they typically live in, which are going to be in and around the water. Whereas gopher tortoises and other tortoises have more elephant style feet that are gonna help them move around on land, which is a really important, important adaptation. Now, like I mentioned before, Eastern indigo snakes are one of those animals that really rely on gopher tortoise burrows. Eastern indigo snakes, they're going to live underground a lot of times, again, in these types of burrows, so they can cool off and as well as so they can rest. Now, not everyone is a fan of snakes and I completely understand that. However, I do ask you to respect the important role that they have in our environment. So snakes are predatory animals and predatory animals like indigo here are going to eat things like rats and mice. And even though rats and mice are super cool and very smart animals, they multiply very quickly. And what happens is if they are left unchecked by predators like indigo, then they can multiply a lot and they can end up in our homes, our pantries, and sometimes they can spread diseases that can communicate to you or that can transfer to humans. And it's, so that's why it's really important to have predators like indigo to kind of control that population. Now, indigo is a species of non-venomous snake. I promise you I would not be holding her with my bare hands if she was venomous. But venom is just another way that snakes subdue their prey or overpower their prey. They inject a toxin into them. However, indigo does not do that. Some snakes will actually squeeze their prey. They're called constrictors, kind of like a python and indigo doesn't do that either. Instead, she will use her body weight and sheer force to kind of slam her body into a prey animal and then stun them and then use her very powerful jaws to kind of overpower that prey. So pretty unique animal in that aspect. Now, gopher tortoises are an endangered species, unfortunately. And the reason for that is that they like to build their homes in the same types of soil that we like to build our homes. So what happens is if we build a structure and we don't care about what animals live there, then animals like gopher tortoises no longer have as much space to survive. And what happens is when these guys go, their numbers go down, then indigo snakes like indigo here, their numbers also decrease. Eastern indigo snakes are a threatened species because of their lack of shelter. And so as unfortunate and sad as it is that animals do need our help, I know it can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming, but we're here to reassure you that there are actually things that you guys can do every single day, you and I can do every single day to really make an impact on animals in their natural habitat. So Morgan, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that we can do to help red fronted macaws? Yeah, so like uh, Lane said, there's a lot of things we can do to help red fronted macaws in the wild. And one of these is to shop sustainably. So you can always shop sustainably by looking for products that are Rainforest Alliance certified. And these products have a special tree frog certification on those products. And they are helped to tell you that these products are sustainably harvested and grown. So a lot of these products come from anything from coffee to chocolate to napkins to diapers. You can also go to their website and it'll give you a full list of all these products. You can also shop paper products or tree products that are FSC uh, certified. And that is the <laughs> Forest Stewardship Council certified. And that means that these are also grown and harvested trees that are done sustainably. So they're really good, especially for corrosion because his area is being disrupted before by deforestation. deforestation. So these products really help these birds in their natural habitat. Yeah. Lane can tell us stuff about the native ones. Absolutely. And not only does shopping sustainably help animals across the world, but they can also help animals in your own area, like as it, you know, as it reported, it help these guys too. So something that zoos, AZA accredited zoos and aquariums are doing is something called a species survival plan. And a species survival plan is essentially this cooperation amongst different facilities that makes sure that we have a genetically diverse population of animals within our facilities so that if unfortunately an animal does go extinct in their natural habitat, we can start a breeding program and possibly reintroduce them back into their natural habitat. And something cool that the Central Florida Zoo does specifically with Eastern Indigo Snakes is we have a facility off property that um, is called the Orient Center for Indigo Conservation. And this is a facility completely dedicated to breeding and releasing Eastern Indigo Snakes back into their natural habitat so that they can do that really important job of hunting all those prey animals. If you guys would ever like to donate to that cause and to that facility, if you go on our website, the centralfloridazoo.org, there is a, an adopt an indigo button that you can click on and any proceeds that are gained from you donating to that program go directly to that facility that again helps breed and release these indigo snakes, which is a really 
tangible thing um, for us to be able to do to help him out. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and start collecting, um, taking any questions that you guys might have. So please feel free to drop those in the chat. Morgan here is going to ask those questions, and we're going to answer them to the best of our ability. One of the questions was, how long will the indigo snake grow? How long will it get? That's a great question. So this is an adult size. So visually, this is how big they get. However, if you like numbers, five to seven feet is uh, roughly the average length that an eastern indigo snake so a pretty big snake and a pretty big body snake, and that's going to help them really overpower their prey, which is pretty cool. Nicole asks, what are animals, what other animals are the birds present predators? So that's a great question. Frozen, like I said before, one of the reasons that he is endangered is because people actually, so the deforestation, also the farmers as well, but their main predator in the wild would be bigger birds. So bigger birds of prey, like a peregrine falcon, things like that are his number one predator in the wild. Another question we have here is, is that a, a poisonous snake? Which I think you met, met or answered already. It's another Go good ahead. question. Um, so there is a little bit of confusion between poison and venom. Venom is something that gets injected into you. So think of like if a venomous snake were to bite something, it would inject venom into it, or even a wasp might sting something, it's going to inject venom. Whereas poison is something that you would have to eat in order to get sick from. So indigo here happens to be neither of those things. She is neither poisonous nor is she venomous. So she's completely safe, safe for me to handle. However, I definitely don't recommend handling snakes out in their natural habitat because indigo was uh, born in human care, so she is very used to being handled like this, whereas your wild snakes might not be used to it and they might act up. Scarlet asked, why are Brosia's cheeks so fluffy? So that was a good question. Frozen really, really likes attention. So right now, um, me and Lane are out here and the video camera is on him. So he is very fluffy because he's really excited. That's also why he's dancing quite a bit and showing off to the camera. It's because parrots, um, in general, really like attention. So that is the main reason why his cheeks and feathers are so fluffy. We have one more question here. Is it okay to help a go gopher tortoise cross the road? So that's an awesome question as well. My my general idea would be if you don't have to touch a wild animal, that you shouldn't. However, one of those few exceptions could be helping a tortoise cross the road. I would recommend not handling them with or bare hands, however, because wild animals can sometimes carry diseases that could make you or your pet sick. So I would definitely recommend using some sort of maybe towel or blanket or something you might have in your car to help them. Also, it's always a good rule of thumb that anytime you do help a, a turtle or a tortoise cross the road, to always help them in the direction that they were headed originally. Because if you bring them back the opposite way, they're just going to find themselves back on that road again. But I would say most of the time you should probably not handle wild animals. However, in those special situations, I think it would be okay using the proper um, protection for yourself. Okay, we will do one more question. And that question is gonna be for all of these guys and is how long do they live? Which I said before, Brosian can live to be about his 50s or 60s. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so these guys can be around 70 um, to 80. And then Eastern Indigo snakes can live to be about 25 years old. Um, and I don't think I mentioned before, but she's about 12 years old right now, whereas he is 31 years old. So these are all long-lived animals, which is pretty, um, pretty cool. Well, we wanna thank you guys so much